This is the definition of product market fit. When you're selling something that you're not even offering. Do you want to impact the world and still turn a profit? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Growth Everywhere. This is the show where you'll find real conversations with real entrepreneurs. They'll share everything from their biggest struggle to the exact strategies they use on a daily basis. So if you're ready for a value-packed interview, listen on. Here's your host, Eric Sue. How many of you have experienced making a bad hire or had bad hires on your team? I personally lost over $840,000 on just one bad hire alone. So that's why I'm doing a free class called the five secrets to avoiding bad hires that can cost you $50,000 plus each. All you need to do is to text bad hire, spell it out, B-A-D-H-I-R-E to 33444. That's double three, triple four, and you'll be registered. I'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Growth Everywhere, where we interview entrepreneurs and bring you business and personal growth tips. Today, we have Tucker Max, which I've been a fan of for over well over 11 years. A uh, big fan of his writings. He's the author of I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, Assholes Finish First, and Hilarity Ensues. All three of these are New York Times bestsellers. He has been nominated to Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential List, and he has sold well over 300, 3 million copies of his books. And one interesting note, he used to get 400 email messages a day, including an average of five offers of sex from women. Tucker, how are you doing? Yeah, not, not all of them were from women. Some would come from dudes. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Tucker, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, which I know is really uh, diverse, but uh, you know, feel free to start from wherever, and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, man. Well, I was born a small boy. And... No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, where do you want me to start? Like, I can, uh, I can kind of go through a lot of different things. It's yeah, let's start from the Tucker Max. Uh, let, let's start from those stories. Let's go from there and then uh, all the way to where you are now. Right. So uh, I basically became a writer by accident. Um, what happened was after law school, I went to law school at Duke, and uh, I had like eight or nine really, really good friends there. And once we left law school, uh, you know, being a lawyer is pretty much the worst job on earth, and we hated it. So we would, uh, you know, send emails to each other uh, all day long. Like er everyone who went to college or grad school has those group of friends, you know, where you guys keep doing that after you leave for a little while. And so uh, we would always get drunk and do stupid things like everyone in our 20s. And I just happened to write really funny emails about it. Um, and those emails uh, got forwarded. They, my friends would forward them to their friends and they kind of became this internet phenomenon. And this is I don't know how old your your listeners are, but the older ones will remember like when email forwards were a thing before like this is before not just before Twitter and Facebook. This is before like MySpace and Friendster even, and uh, okay. like like back when GeoCities was still a thing, right? <laughs> and um and, and so uh, anyway, so I got fired after law school. I was fired from uh, being a lawyer, <laughs> and then. Then I worked for my dad, who runs uh, some restaurants in South Florida, owns a bunch of restaurants in South Florida, and he fired me from the family business. And so my friends were like, look, dude, obviously you're not very good at law and business, but these emails you're writing are like the funniest shit we've ever read. This is what you should be doing. And, uh, and so I, 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 this is O2, so I had to learn to code HTML to put up a website. Like that's how long ago this was, right? <laughs> yeah. Like uh, WordPress was not even a, a thing. Blogs were not even a thing yet. And um, I put my stuff up. Actually, before I even put this stuff up, I sent inquiries to, um, I don't know, probably at least 500 and maybe upwards of 1,000 agents and publishers and, and whatever. And this is back when agents and publishers actually made money and, and weren't a dying industry. And uh, I got zero response, like a, literally 100% rejection, even to the point where some editors and agents like wrote me personalized rejections telling me that like I was the worst writer that they'd ever read and that I should never write anything again the rest of my life and things like that, right? It's like the Disney and, story. Right, yeah, it is. It, it, it actually kind of is. And, um, and so uh, anyway, so I, I then, that's when I put the website up and the website blew up. And, um, you know, then, of course, the publishers came back to me and they wanted, uh, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, like, all the same stories that everyone rejected became the core of the book uh, that sold 
two million copies and invented a literary genre and kind of launched my career, I hope they serve you in hell. Like the first five stories, I think, are, or five of the first 10 are literally straight from emails I sent to my friends and, and exactly what I sent to every publisher in New York and got rejected. Then, you know, that become that my website blew up and then books and, you know, now here I am. Got it. Okay, cool. And, you know, just for the context, I mean, for the audience, or those people that don't know Tucker, I mean, my, my friends and I, I mean, in high school, we used to talk about you and we used to idolize you. I mean, you were, you know, Dan Blazarian before Dan Blazarian. <laughs> I'm like, this is how a man should be. So you're like this, you know, this, this idol figure. And then um, I guess what was the turning point for, for um, you know, getting, you know, for you, you know, starting your website and then getting to, you know, become this massive brand that you are now? Well, okay, so... Actually, I should say that's not where we are now because what's funny is let, let me actually uh, amend the story a little bit um, or continue it. I stopped writing Fratire in 2011. I retired. Um, like after uh, my last book came out, Hilarity Ensues, and, you know, I started when I was like 26 or 27. And at that point, I was, I don't know, 34, 35. And I was like, I, you know, when you're 35, you don't do the stupid uh, stuff you do when you're 25. You know, and so I just didn't have any more funny, ridiculous stories to tell of me hooking up or throwing up on myself or or whatever, all the things that I wrote about. So I ended up retiring and then doing other things, which is actually what kind of brings us to now. But your question is a little bit different, which is how did I how did I do that? Right. So how did I kind of create this um, this I, I hate to say brand, because here's the thing, man, uh, I get your question. It's like totally valid question. I get it all the time. But I'm not, a, I'm not a brand. All I really am is a person, you know? Like, you can, and don't get me wrong, you can turn yourself into a brand. Lady Gaga has done it. Like you even mentioned, Dan Bilzerian's kind of doing it now in a, in a very different way. Kim Kardashian's definitely done it. Uh, I, I never saw myself as a brand. And you can kind of look at my career trajectory in the, the sort of frat tire time. And, and I didn't. Whether it was right or wrong, and I think you could definitely argue I made a lot of bad decisions business-wise, but um, I never took the brand route, you know? Like, there was never Tucker Max vodka or Tucker Max, like, whatever, shirts or anything like that. Like, it was never – it wasn't a lifestyle brand. I always just saw myself as a guy writing about things that he did in his life in a funny way. And, um, and that was – it's good and bad, you know, like it's good because it was really easy for me to be authentic and to be true to myself. And, and that's how I got, I think my success is by not trying to be a brand because once you try to become a brand, then almost uniformly, you're going to have to do something artificial unless your brand is artificial from the start. Like Kim Kardashian is such a perfect example of how to turn sort of a self into a brand but the thing is, from the very beginning, her brand uh, was what it is now, you know? And, and so it makes sense. Whereas I started off uh, very different than I would have had to become to sort of become a brand, you know? For the, like, the idea that the, the guy who was writing these emails to his friends would uh, be a paragon of masculinity and a lifestyle and have vodka and clothing associated with him would be ridiculous to that guy. So to turn into that would, by its uh, very um, nature, deform sort of my like who who I was in my brand. You know what I'm saying? So it, like if you're trying to create a personal brand, uh, and, and I kind of did, I guess. But if that's what you want to do, you need to understand why you're doing it and what your purpose is and what your long term goals are. And it once you understand that, then you can kind of start. Uh, at the right place and get to where you want to be, you know, whereas I, I, I didn't really do that. I just decided to write funny stories and was just who I was. So I don't know how much I fit into the person, you know, I, I, the part of me that fits into personal brand is by accident and it's not orchestrated or, um, or constructed the way that Kardashian or Kanye West or Paris Hilton are. Got it. So are you saying there is no methodical strategy to it in the beginning? It kind of just, you know, grew organically in terms of your following? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because you got to remember, man, I did this in 02, 03, 04. When I was starting, there wasn't any such thing as like a writer getting paid on the internet. There was no such thing as like, there was no model for what I did. 
And um, I, look, I would love to sit in this podcast and tell you what a genius I was that I thought <laughs> all of this up ahead of time and I knew everything was going to happen. But that, of course, would be total bullshit and none of it would be true. The, all I really did, man, was sort of react to incentives in front of me. And I was fairly intelligent some of the time. And I made some good decisions some of the time and probably less than half the time, but just enough that uh, and I had good stuff. I had good content. Um, and, uh, I had re- actually had really good content and I made just enough good decisions that I didn't screw myself up, but no, man, like none of this is, is sort of orchestrated or constructed, um, which, and the evidence is, is pretty clear because, uh, you can see people who have done it like sort of with a plan from the beginning and they've gotten way bigger than me and done way better than me. Uh, and, and, and because they had a, a really good plan, even though a lot of times they don't have as much to offer, they had a much better plan from the beginning. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. And before we go on, can you explain what frat tire means to the audience? So I didn't make this word up. I want to be real clear about this. <laughs> um, when my first book came out, uh, it kind of started a wave of, of really what's transformed into the manosphere now. A lot of it, I don't want to take all the credit for it because that's ridiculous, but um, I was one of the original people who got attention for sort of masculine voices in culture and art, at least modern, you know, late 20th, early 21st century masculine voices in art. And the New York Times, uh, like, sort of did this trend piece, and uh, they, they said it's like a combination of, like, a fraternity ethic and satire, so they called it fratire, except what's so stupid is... I wasn't in a fraternity and I don't write satire. So it's like, I don't know, man. It's like basically any writing that is unapologetically masculine and also humorous fits into the um, fratire genre. <laughs> cool. You know what? I think to give the audience some context about you know what your writing really is like and who you really are, can you give us, why don't you just tell us a story, like your most outrageous story that you can share? Well, there's nothing I can't share. Like that's part of what... Um, what I think made my writing so appealing is that, look, he, I mean, you really want me to tell us like a, like a, one of my old stories from my books and stuff? I think so, because that's where you got started. And I think that comes from the foundation of everything, right? You're all not right, like that right. anymore, but I think it's good. Um, okay. Uh, like, this is not my most outrageous story. But basically, my books are all, all the stupid, crazy stuff that guys and girls do in their 20s and in college. Uh, I just wrote all that down. Right. So here's here's a good example. Um, <laughs> this is not my craziest story, but this is just the one that popped into my head to tell. So uh, this one time I was in Dallas and I met this girl and whatever. Uh, uh, we we kind of hit it off at the bar and um, and we went back to her place. And uh, I had the reason like she's one of those girls who's like, oh, I don't sleep with anyone. I'm, I meet out, I don't do random hookups, and of course the whole time I'm looking at her like, of course you're not. Obviously you're not. Like, because the girls that don't do that, all they do is talk about how they don't do that for two hours. So, yeah, sure, right? And so, of course, I'm laughing, whatever. And then this girl uh, also, at the same as she's telling me what a great girl she is and how she never hooks up with anybody, or blah, 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 she's ordering like 20 shots. Uh, like, we didn't have 20, but it was some insane number of drinks and of course she's getting bombed because she wanted to be able to conv- like to to hook up with me but didn't want to like uh accept sort of the the blame herself you know and so uh she wanted to do something that she wanted to do but w- wouldn't accept when she was sober so we get hammered go back to her place and um <laughs> hook up and she gets uh, like to go to the bathroom uh afterwards uh and i like can feel it coming and I drink way too much and I booted everywhere. Right. But here's the thing. I was like, all right, I don't want to throw up in her bed because I want to keep having sex with her. Right. So I wasn't really sure. And I couldn't go in the bathroom because she's already in there. So I pulled her bed away from the wall and just threw up like (laughs) down the side of, uh, of the wall behind the bed. Right. And I threw up a lot, (laughs) Like, like enough to fill, I don't know, a couple of glasses. It was really bad. And, um, but, you know, I'm an experienced drinker, so I kind of booted, wiped my face a little bit, and then acted like nothing was wrong. She came back in the room. We hooked up again, and then I passed out. 
And <laughs> the next morning, so the next morning uh, I wake up and it's kind of like uh, dusky out. It's like light. The sun's coming up and I've got to, I really got to pee, right? So I'm all hungover and I can't, t- you know, you don't know what's going on. And I see like all this stuff all over the floor. I assume like it's her shoes or something. I don't know. I'm too hungover to worry about it. So I start walking to the bathroom. And I feel myself that, you know, have you ever barefoot stepped in poop? Yes. Like, okay. So, like, it squishes through your toes and you know immediately <laughs> it's poop. So, I straight up stepped in poop on the, on the uh, floor. And I look down. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And then I realize all the stuff on her floor that I thought was, like, shoes. It's not shoes. It's poop. And I was like, oh, hold on. So, like, I kind of, like, like, go back over to the bed and wake At first, I thought – Hold on, did this girl shit all over her floor? But that made no sense because I saw her go into the bathroom. Well, I wake her up and she looks at it and she goes, oh, no. And she starts yelling like, Callie, Callie. So apparently, I didn't know this, she has a dog, right? And her dog her dog had, in the middle of the night, gotten under the bed and eaten all of my throw up, right? Oh. And got sick and shit all over the bedroom. <laughs> like I didn't realize this until the next morning when I stepped in the poop and then like I kind of looked when she was like cleaning up the poop and scolding the dog I looked under the bed and saw like oh my god almost all of that vomit is gone there was just a stain on the wall and all of it was gone and I'd eaten like steak that night for dinner so there was so much vomit <laughs> and this dog ate it all and shit everywhere and of course she thought the dog was just being bad uh, no, the dog ate all my vomit and uh, and got sick. And then, of course, I've never told her, so I have no idea. I probably started stinking in a room afterwards. I don't know. But um, <laughs> but that's – okay, so like – okay, I, I'm a better writer than I'm a storyteller uh, verbally. So my book is, books are just stories like that told in a really funny way of all the same ridiculous shit that we all did at that age. Uh, that's really it. Like that's all they are. Got it. Okay. So this is content marketing before content marketing, before people started talking about, oh, you got to write good content and all that stuff that you hear. No, it's not. No, here's the thing, because content marketing is about promoting some other thing, right? So that's the difference. I'm not a content marketer because like HubSpot does amazing content marketing because at the end of the day, they're trying to sell HubSpot services. My stories don't sell anything else. People pay for my content. So like there's a big difference if if the content is the end goal then the content itself must be really good that's basically hollywood like movies are not content marketing it's paid content right uh like everything on netflix is not content marketing there's no, there's nothing that's upselling you know so i was it's not content marketing it was it was like my shit had to be so good on its own that people would pay for it because it was so entertaining not Whereas content marketing, the goal is to make something so good that people will read it uh, uh, for free, and then hopefully you can get them to do something with that information that that helps your business. You that's see? how I that's how I saw it before in the past when we saw your janky website, and we're like, this is really good shit because it inspires us. So to us in that time, I think it would be considered content marketing. But I, I get what you're saying totally. Um, so let's say this, okay? Hypothetically speaking, if you never decided to write about your experiences. And you didn't build a career around them. I mean, would all that ridiculousness have been worth it? Of course. Why do you think I did it? I did all that most, not all of it, but most of it before I ever even dreamed of being a writer. Like, dude, that's, I mean, let me ask you, do you go out and and get drunk with your friends and try and pick up girls and act silly? Absolutely. Right. Why do you do it? Because it's fun. Exactly. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Everything I did. I did because in the moment I thought it was really fucking fun. It just turns out, it happens to turn out that if I if I write about it in a really intelligent, funny way, that other people will pay to read what I write. Right. I didn't know that going in. You know, no no one no one goes out to get drunk and hook up because they want some other goal. In fact, most of what people do, uh, accomplishment wise, is to get girls to like them. Like that's the goal. Why, why do you think most? Why do you think men do anything? You, if we didn't care what women thought about us, men would not have startups or charities or uh, sporting events or anything. Hundred like, percent. It's 100%. all. It's all because we want women to like us, and that's the main way we can do it is by accomplishing things. Got it. Now you know 
in, in the past, I think you, you've you've you know alluded to possibly having something that's similar to, or if there isn't, if there is even something like this, you know, narcissistic personality disorder in your twenties and not caring about others. And then now, fundamentally, my understanding is that you're a different person. So, what do you think changed? Uh, I mean, the easiest, quickest answer is just that I grew up. I mean, that's it. Like. I, I don't think I had real narcissistic personality disorder. In fact, I went on Dr. Drew's show, and we both took the NPD uh, inventory, and he actually scored higher on it than I did. Uh, so, like, I, I don't really have NPD. But that being said, I was very narcissistic. And I think a lot of guys in their uh, 20s uh, are. Not all of them, by any stretch. Some guys have the opposite problem. They have absolutely no confidence, and they're not narcissistic enough. But... Um, I was definitely on the far end of narcissism. And, dude, a lot of that I think is just a function of when you are young and if you haven't done anything in your life, then you don't know how to get attention. And so you try a bunch of different things. And for some guys, uh, sort of like selling yourself basically is the way to get attention before you've actually done anything. You know, it's funny, man. It's the, the more that I've accomplished, the more that I accomplish in my life, it feels like th not, of course, I get more confident, but it's like the less I talk about myself and the less I feel the need to promote myself or to brag or to do any of that stuff. Um, I mean, at this point in my life, I've done a shitload of stuff and accomplished a lot. And if I met someone out, I, I don't even I don't even think to mention it. I don't bring it up. I don't whatever any of that stuff just because like I've actually done it, you know, but when I was when I was living the life that became all these stories, I had done shit in my life, man. Like uh, like I was just another schlub at a bar uh, drinking too much, trying to get girls to pay attention to them. So that's sort of uh, a strategy that can work for a lot of guys. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so it's it's really the people that don't talk about themselves that much are the people that are really doing something. You yeah, well, usually not always. Man. There's not like a, it's not a hard and fast rule. There, there are a lot of people out there who talk a lot who are doing shit. Like uh, Jason Calacanis, he won't shut the fuck up, but he <laughs> he gets a lot done. You know, like True. he really does. You know, whereas yeah, there's a ton of people who don't say anything and they get a ton done. Like I mean, there's a million people in Silicon Valley from Steve Jobs all the way down. Um, Elon Musk, he doesn't talk much and he gets a ton done too. So it's it's not a one to one correlation. You know what I'm saying? And there are a lot of people who don't talk and they don't get anything done, you know? And there are a lot of people who do talk a lot who don't get anything done. So I think you kind of have to know the person and look at the person. I, for me, the, the big switch came when I realized, not just when I had accomplished a lot and I started to become actually truly confident, um, but also when I realized that talking was trading off with me listening and connecting with people which is sort of a different thing than accomplishments, right? Um, but, like, I think I realized in my early 30s that, um, that just selling, I guess, myself or just being narcissistic, it can be really fun if you have a lot of short-term sort of surface relationships. But after a while, those get to be boring and tedious, and, and they are, you see them for what they are, which is fairly shallow, which doesn't mean they're bad all around. It just means... You know, like at some point, almost all people want more, right? And uh, and once I started to want more from uh, my relationships, especially with women, then, uh, you know, romantic relationships with women, then I realized, okay, being a narcissist is the opposite of connecting with people and having productive, meaningful relationships. Because to do that, you have to connect. And the way you connect is, is by listening and being vulnerable and sharing things, and that's like the opposite of narcissism. And so once I started doing that, then, then um, or once I realized that, then I started learning how to do those things, and then I kind of shifted. And now, you know, I'm married. I have a kid. I, um, you know, I've always had f great friends. Uh, now I think I have, weirdly, I think I have fewer friendships, but they're much closer and they're much more sort of productive, as a, as opposed to like, you know, having lots and lots of people you know decently well, but like. You might not call them if you go to jail or something, you know. <laughs> Whereas now, if I had an emergency, like the list of people I could call uh, and know that they would come get me is much longer, I think, than it used to be. Even though it's like a shorter overall list, if that makes sense. 
totally makes sense. And I, I think that's, you know, that's, that's a really important fundamental shift. I mean, you know, you talk about selling all the time. I just had a friend the other day, um, you know, really successful guy. And he said, you know, he was just having a conversation with someone at the bar and literally he let the other guy talk for about an hour. And that guy said, thank you. I just had, you know, this was one of the most interesting, you know, interesting conversations. So I guess from your side of things, how did you switch to listening more? Cause that's something that even for me, it, it's super hard to adapt to right now. You know, everyone just wants to keep selling. Right. Right. Uh, it, it's pretty simple actually. <clears throat> I, all I did was I started applying, um, the lessons that I had learned in how to kind of deal with women just to life overall. So, uh, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you the very specific, uh, sort of example. When I was, I don't know, early twenties, I always thought I had to convince women to sleep with me. Right. And that's really stupid. If you know women, you understand that women, uh, like you're never going to convince a woman to have sex. Uh, either they want to have sex or not. And really what they're deciding is who they want to have sex with. And the only way you're, that they're going to want to have sex with you is if they're attracted to you. And attraction is not about persuasion. Attraction is a function of who you are and how you interact with them. Right? So once I learned that lesson, then I realized, oh, wow, my goal should not be to tell this girl how awesome I am but it should be to figure out what's interesting about her. And, and once I figure that out, we can connect on that. And then she's going to be uh, very attracted to me. Um, or that's the way for her to be attractive to, uh, attracted to me if she's going to be at all. And, and then once I, I just started applying that to sort of life and business, and I was like, oh, right. So like anyone I meet, uh, if I make my goal to figure out what's interesting about them, then what I do is I ask them questions and then I actively listen and I respond to those uh, things that are interesting and compelling to me that the person likes. And so then basically all that – if you read any of the great conversation books like uh, Dale Carnegie stuff or Robin Deke stuff or any of that stuff, that's exactly what they teach is find common ground, connect on it, you know, actively listen, connect on it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what you could do – if you're not good at listening, what you could do is – uh, make that your goal, not to listen, right? Because that making listening your goal is really hard because then you, you don't know what you're listening for and you, you don't ever talk and then it's like a weird one-way conversation and that's never fun. If you make it about I'm going to figure out what's fun and cool and interesting about this person, then you're actively looking for something. You're listening to what they say because you're looking for that thing. And once you find that thing that you guys connect on, then you can have like a really engaged conversation, right? So like if it's CrossFit or what the fuck ever, uh, SEO, then it's like, oh, this person knows a ton about SEO, but they know about it from the dental space and I know about it from the, I don't know, digital uh, sort of product space and it's so cool and blah, 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 whatever. You know what I'm saying? Um, that, whoops, sorry. That's how I've always done it and that's what's worked for me, uh, I think, really well. That's super interesting because, you know, what you just mentioned, you know, striving to just listen is exactly what, you know, I've been stuck, you know, I've gotten in that, that pattern before and it's just, you, you get stuck, right? Because you don't know how to respond and, and it, it, you come off as disingenuous ultimately when you don't know what to say, um, at least from my perspective. But figuring out what's fun or at least figuring out, you know, having some type of end goal behind it, I think is at least gives a better target to aim for. So, so thank you for that. Yeah. Well, just think what's interesting about this person. Interesting to you, not overall, because once you find what's interesting to you about them, now you and him or her have something to talk about that's compelling to both of you. And that's how you connect is, is you find common ground or commonality for things you're both interested in and you, you, you share parts of yourself about them, you're vulnerable, you're uh, empathetic, etc. And then it's really easy to go to the next step. Love it. All right. Let's switch gears here. So let's, you know, Tucker Max does startups. Let's talk about your new business. Right. So uh, uh, it's called Book in a Box. And it's, um, we kind of, dude, we stumbled upon this by accident. And I actually feel really stupid because I could have done this like eight years ago or six years ago. And I could have made so much money. And I didn't do it because I was stupid before. Uh, or I didn't see it because I was stupid. Basically, what happened is this entrepreneur came to me and she's like, look, I don't have any time and I'm dyslexic. And I, I, I but I had this great idea for a book. And people have been asking me to write it for years. So how can I get a book without having to sit down and write it and deal with the publishing process? And I looked at her like uh, very condescendingly, to be honest. And, and, and I was like, 
well, you can't have a book without writing a book. And I like started to lecture her about hard work and all that kind of stuff. And this woman's built like a huge company. She's, <laughs> she, she, she's much, much more successful than me. And, um, and so she kind of rolls her eyes at me. Right. And she's like, look, Tucker, are you an entrepreneur? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'd like to think I am. And she's like, well, I'm an entrepreneur too. What do you do in your job? Because I know in my job, I solve problems. And I was like, oh, shit. she just called me out. And I was like, all right, fine. So we like I couldn't think of how to get a book without writing a book. Right. Uh, but uh, over the next couple of weeks, I talked to a friend of mine and we kind of came up with a process where basically we would outline her idea, then interview her, get the interview transcribed, give it to a professional editor who would turn the, the audio transcript into um, a book. Uh, or to book pros, and then we could do the rest of the publishing process. And so all she would have to do is spend like 12 hours on the phone with us. And she thought it was amazing. We tested it. It worked great. Her book is out now. She's signed like um, several million dollar clients off of this. Uh, she's a a, a, consult, a retail consultant. Um, and she, uh, uh, so she hadn't sold many copies, but like she's ROI'd the book like a thousand X or something crazy like that or a hundred X. And, um, and so she loved it and it was like, okay, this is pretty cool. And as we were doing this, I went on Lewis Howes' podcast and just talked about what we were doing, not even like as a business, just like, oh, like Lewis is talking about being dyslexic. And so I started talking about what we're doing and he's like, that's an amazing idea. He's like, what do you call it? I'm like, I don't know. We call it book in a box. <laughs> and then, so we ended up signing like four or five clients off of his podcast. And this is like before we even had a company or even like a landing page. And it was like, I, I went to Zach and I was, it was my co-founder. I was like, dude, this is the definition of product market fit. When you're selling something that you're not even offering, like the, there's a, obviously a huge market here. And so, uh, we kind of tested it for a while and there was like, there's a lot of people who want books who either don't have the time or the patience or the uh, skill set to do it properly. And so we focus on right now, we're focusing on people who have a lot of money, but no time. And we basically turn their ideas and words into books. Got it. So what's the bare minimum criteria for that? Uh, well, so you have to be able to pay us like the, the starting package is about $15,000. So it's not cheap. Uh, and then uh, to work with us, we, we, we kind of, we, we accept most people who come, but not all. I think maybe about 90% we accept. But the, the ones that we've rejected either are people who are like kind of clearly disasters as humans and we don't want to waste time working with them because they're just going to be awful people. Um, or people who don't have enough ideas to even make a book. You know, like there are people who come to us as like, I want a book. And it's like, okay. What do you have to say? And they're like, I don't know. Can't you just write a book? And we're like, no, that's called ghostwriting. And ghostwriters cost fifty to $100,000. And you can hire those people and they'll write your book for you. You don't even have to be involved. Our service is much cheaper uh, because we, we're able to take people's ideas and words and turn them into a book, not write the book for them, which is uh, sort of a, a distinction that most people get, but some people still don't understand. So if, if someone, if you don't have anything to say, we can't help you with that, but we can turn your ideas into books. And, and, and look, if they're bad ideas, then it's going to be a really well-published, beautiful-looking, well-organized book of bad ideas. But if they're great ideas, then it'll be a great book. Interesting. Oh, I'm surprised no one has done this yet. But uh, Yeah, I am too. It's It's one of those things, as soon as we kind of started selling it or, or put it out there. I mean, we, we, we've, our, our problem has been finding enough freelancers, uh, to help us, uh, quality freelancers to help us do this. Um, we finally just hired a, a good sort of bevy or we have a good stable of freelancers we work with and we're launching next, uh, tomorrow actually on product time. And then I'm speaking nice. at, at launch, uh, launch festival, Cal Canis is thing. And, and, um, and we're doing some joint ventures with like some or, or entrepreneurial organizations and stuff. Dude, I am too. This is one of those things where it's like, as soon as we said it, it was like obvious. And everyone who like comes to us is like, oh, how does this not, I love it. I want to do it. How does it not exist? And I don't know the answer. I really don't know why. I, I feel stupid because I could have thought of this six years ago. <laughs> and I could have been, I mean, we've done, I think, 600,000 in sales in the first six months or something like that. So wow. clearly, yeah. and that, and that's like, I won't say we haven't been marketing. We've done just a little bit of marketing to test certain channels until we get the process refined and we're able to scale. 
And that's with just a little bit of marketing. Like, I think this could get pretty big. You know, I don't know if it's, it's probably not a billion dollar company, of course, but um, still, like, there's no shame in an eight or nine figure company. Dude, yeah, I mean, it's real. I mean, doing these podcasts, speaking to launch, I mean, Silicon Valley is right up your alley. Um, pretty much any type of uh, or so. Are you talking like EO, YPO, those type of organizations? Yeah, yeah, Th those are definitely types that, that we're gonna partner with. There's a lot of other. There's C level organizations, speaker organizations, consultants, um, memoirs, like families. A lot of old people want to tell the story of their family, even if it's just for their grandkids and their family. You know. Uh, so ideally long term, we'd like to turn this into uh, software as a service so that people that don't have $15,000 but want to get a book out can, can use our process. Um, I mean, I, I actually described the process in an article I wrote on Medium and LinkedIn. And, um, and I'm, we're going to do a book, actually, How to Write Your Book in 12 Hours, that describes our process. There's nothing proprietary about this. We, we can't patent this. It's all off-the-shelf technology. We do provide a lot of expertise, like knowing how to do an outline makes, I mean, that's, the, that's really the skill. Um, that's the big skill is being able to take a bunch of ideas and structure them properly into an outline is difficult. Um, and then also taking audio transcription and turning it into book prose in a way that reads really well uh, without losing any meaning, that's also difficult. So there are hard parts of this, but it's mainly just expertise. It's not, there's no secret to it, you know? Okay. Perfect. And just for everyone in the audience, um, we're definitely going to share the notes to the, the business. Uh, uh, yeah, that'll be in there. And then we're going to share the notes also to the Medium post as well. So no worries for any of you. Um, so you talked about, you know, having, you know, struggling in terms of finding like, you know, uh, freelancers and things like that. I mean, uh, what is the biggest struggle by far that you face while growing this business? Oh, yeah, it's talent. No doubt. Like figuring the process out was relatively, I don't want to say it was easy for Zach, but it was, or Zach and I, it was relatively straightforward because, uh, Zach's a really smart dude and he's good at process and I've you know I mean I've written I'm a best-selling author who's written millions of words in his life so content and structure and stuff were were, were, were straightforward for me what, what's been really hard is uh, you know because to scale Zach and I can't do all this work like we did the first couple but it's like okay now we need to find really talented freelancers and we found definitely some most of the freelancers we work with are better at this than Zach and I like uh, we just Let's see, for example, we've got one former Simon & Schuster editor, a former HarperCollins editor. Uh, we've got a Washington Post journalist that we work with. We've got uh, – who's still at the Post and does this in our spare time. Uh, we, and we have really – a couple – actually two best-selling writers who do this uh, in their spare time. Like sort of – you know, they just pick up gigs because we pay really well for this. We pay anywhere from $50 to $150 an hour uh, to uh, our sort of high-talent freelancers. And there's, those people exist and they're out there. It's just not easy to find them. And then we have to kind of train them a little bit and, um, and, and that kind of stuff. So it, it's, we have a good process for that now, but it took us about four to six months to really figure out how do we find these people? How do we vet them? How do we train them to our process? Not, not really, you know, cause they already know how to write and edit. Um, that, that's talent, man. Like almost every company, that's the bottleneck. We, we don't need to raise money. Like we're already we're crazy cash flow positive. Uh, until we do the software as a service, we're not going to need to raise money. It's just finding the good people and setting up a good process to work with them, where they can be super productive and we can get sort of the results for our clients, our authors that that they want. Right. And how are you finding? The, you know, feel free to share whatever you can from this. But how are you finding this great talent? You know, you mentioned a lot of these cool people. Right. So um, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, like. Uh, all of the, the sort of uh, virtual assistant sites are total garbage. Uh, if you want really high-quality talent, Elance and Odesk are not good. They're good for sort of low- to mid-level talent. So we have to go to places like uh, Media Bistro, Publishers Weekly, sort of industry-specific um, uh, job sites or blogs. Uh, there tend to be a lot of good people on there. And to be honest, the, the best way – the best talent we've found – has almost all come from uh, our personal networks. Like I know a lot of people in publishing and I have a lot of friends and it's like, we, I, I kind of just ask them, who do you know that's good? Who's looking for freelance work, whatever. And our, I would say half, more than half of our best people have come through network connections. Got it, okay. Cool. So let's uh, switch gears again. I mean, I'm definitely gonna check this out after. I mean, book, book in a Box kind of reminds me of Justin Timberlake's song. Um, 
Yeah, that's what everyone says. I know. I, I, I honest to God, was not thinking about Dick in a Box when I named it. The, you know, the name's obvious. It's just sort of like everything you need for your book is is there, and you don't have to do anything. But yeah, Dick in a Box, of course, is uh, the obvious first thing that everyone else but me thinks of. Hey, well, you're in good company at least. Right, right. Uh, so the new Tucker Max that does yoga and eats better. Um, you know, tell us about what you do exactly. Do you, do you have like a morning routine? Anything, anything that you can share around that? Yeah, I stopped doing yoga because I, I, to me, it's kind of pointless to combine meditation and exercise. So now I just meditate and I exercise separately. Um, some people love yoga. Good for them. I just thought it was kind of goofy. Uh, but I tried it for a while. It just doesn't work. Yeah, so my routine is pretty simple. Um, wake up, take my dog for a walk, uh, you know, uh, hang out with my wife and son. Then I for maybe 30 minutes an hour. Then um, meditate for like 20 minutes. Then I start work, and I, I every uh, day I'm blocked off uh, between uh, eight and twelve. Like I don't, I don't take meetings, I don't take calls, no one can talk to me. That's sort of my uh, work, getting work done block. And then um, afternoon is when I like take, you know, I, I, all my calls, like you know, like we're doing the podcast now, or I have meetings, or or, you know, company stuff or whatever. Um, that's all from like 12 to about four. Then, uh, you know, I go CrossFit at like five, uh, come home, you know, we have dinner. I mean, dude, I live a really boring domestic life now. Like, I love it. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. The thought of going out drinking like on 6th Street or Randy Street, I, you know, I live in Austin, is like at 26, that would have been the coolest thing. I'd be like, oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait to go get drunk tonight and pick up girls. At 39, the thought of having to go out drinking on rainy is like, oh, God, I'd rather die. <laughs> <laughs> My life is really – all I do, man, is family and work and like sort of things that I like with my friends, and that's it. That's all I do. And those things are now just very different than, than – they were in the twenties. Totally, and then when you have, I mean, you know, when you have a wife and kids, and you're doing the startup, I think the only interesting thing is being going into grandpa mode. Um, so yeah. I totally get it. Yeah, well, I mean, like my wife and I do cool stuff. It's just totally different. Like last night, we went to a cheese tasting. You know, <laughs> like it's just like right. such, like the idea. If you told me at twenty six, I'd be like going to wine and cheese tastings uh, and loving them and having the best time. I would have fought you and called you a liar and swore that would never happen and then of course here i am and i love it it's awesome you know it, it's just different you know different things at different times in your life uh and i a lot of people can't understand that when you're young and i was i was probably the worst but that's just the way it works you know? totally and let's talk about this i mean this this is always a really interesting question so what's one piece of advice you'd give to your 25 year old self oh god i don't know if i could say anything to him because he would argue with me and he would tell me i was wrong and so I just probably have to fight him. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God, if you put me in front of 25 year old Tucker Max, I would fight him because he was such an idiot. I would, like, I would, I would be so angry at him in no time at all. Um, because that's the thing. That's the advice I would give: is stop thinking you know what you're talking about because you don't. Shut the fuck up and listen and learn from people who are smarter than you and who have done more than you. It doesn't mean like. What I would say to him is like it doesn't mean you can't have new ideas and you can't think of cool shit and that you shouldn't think for yourself, but stop thinking that you know everything because you actually know nothing. Uh, and he wouldn't have listened though. That's the frustrating thing, you know? But that's the advice I would have given. Love it. <laughs> that's the first time I heard that. Yeah, I'm going to fuck up my own self. <laughs> well, because I was such an idiot, man. I was the worst at 25. Like I, I was the type of guy that it's like, okay – when you want to have a party and do crazy shit, call Tucker. If you don't want that, stay away from him because he's a fucking disaster. Like that that's who I was at that age. Love it. But then you've changed a lot and I I you know, I've done some some research beforehand and it's I think there's this bit about psychoanalysis. Can you talk yeah. a little bit a little bit about that? Yeah, it's just uh when I moved to Austin, uh look, here's the reality. Uh I realized after so I, there's like you know I, I've already had a movie made about my life so I've done quite a bit right but the the movie didn't do well and um, there were a lot of problems with it and um, well I mean it failed quite frankly and uh, I uh, I blamed everyone else at first and then I kind of like had this I don't want to call it epiphany but it was like one of those things where I sat down and I realized okay I was the things I said about why the movie failed were right. Like the director was a piece of shit who did a terrible job, 
But guess what? I picked the fucking director. So whose mm. fault is it really? You know? Mm. And like, and there was a million other things like that where like the, the, the level one explanation is not my fault, but the level two or the level three explanation were pretty much always my fault. And they were always like sort of things that I did that were preventable too. Like if I had just been mature enough or intelligent enough to, to, to sort of see this in myself. And it was one of those things, man, where it's like, but even after it failed, I, I looked at my life and I had everything, right? I, I had best-selling books. I was rich. I was famous. I had all the things that I had wished for as like an 18-year-old uh, I had. And I had even more than I ever w dreamed of having, right? And I still wasn't happy. And so I had to step back and be like, all right, man, if I fixed everything externally in my life, uh, you know, I was in great shape. I was all this stuff. Um, I fixed all that stuff and I'm not happy, then it's got to be something inside me. You know, it's got to be coming from inside and I don't know how to fix that. Uh, clearly, I'm, I'm the one fucking that up. For example, the movie failure. So I need to get someone to help me. And there's a million ways to, to do effective talk therapy and help. Uh, psychoanalysis is just one of them. And um, a, psychoanalysis is basically you go four times a week and you really dig into sort of um, what you're feeling, why, how sort of uh, emotions are interacting with your life, especially in ways you don't really understand, your unconscious, things like that. And it, it I'm actually about to finish. Uh, it take, took me about four years. Some people it takes wow. three, some people it takes 10. Um, and it really helped me sort of understand and see um, all the things I was doing. Uh, to fuck up my own life and all the, f and where the, those sort of things were coming from, you know? And, um, it, it was really invaluable for me, uh, that, especially once I combined psychoanalysis and meditation, that was like, that was the, the, I did that about a year ago. And that was the force multiplier that really enabled me to, um, get past my, my demons and my hurdles and my sort of self-sabotaging behaviors that everyone has mine. You know, I think we're maybe worse than, than most, but but everyone has that stuff. And and now it's like I'm not perfect at all. Really, also analysis does is it gives you the tools so that you can see your own problems and adjust them, uh, fix them in real time. You don't ever get rid of your problems. You know, like you know if 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 your dad beat you when you were six, which is not what happened to me, but like you're never going to be able to change that. But like that trauma creates sort of a set of. Uh, 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 like underlying emotions and unconscious reactions in you. And if you understand that and understand how it plays out, then you have the tools to deal with that your whole life, right? Because the event's never going to change. The trauma is never going to change, but you can deal with it. And, uh, and that's, that's what analysis did with me. It gave me the tools to deal with my problems uh, and my issues and my weaknesses and, uh, and, and sort of help bring my blind spots up. So at least I know these are problems, not instead of, them being problems and me pretending they're not or not knowing. Got it. Now, on a scale of one to ten, how impactful would you say psychoanalysis and meditation have been for you? Ten being the highest. Um, I, I don't know anything else other than ten, simply because or I can't. I can't say anything other than ten, simply because uh, I feel like if I had not done something, and I happen to pick psychoanalysis and meditation, but uh, maybe other things would have worked too, other talk therapies or whatever. But if I had not picked something, then um, I can't imagine that I would be married now. I would have a family now. I can't imagine I would have a successful business, this successful business now. Um, I, like, I'm a really smart guy, and I feel like I, I always land on my feet. But I'm not sure I would have kept doing it, to be honest. Like I feel like I was headed in a direction that was eventually um, going to leave me in a place I didn't want to be. And, um, and I had to really dig deep and look into myself and see, you know, um, the changes I needed to make. Um, so I guess in that regard, it would have to be a 10 because I feel like if I hadn't done that, my life would be fundamentally different and not for the better right now. Yeah, that's interesting. Like you said, it sounded like you're headed for like a dead end and then this, this put you back on the right track, which I think by default, I think this is probably necessary for everyone to at least, you know, take a look at, right? Dude, dude, yes. I, I think if I had not done something, then the peak of my life would have been, I hope they serve beer in hell and the movie and that's it. And then I would have just been like one of those kind of sad people who like has kind of peaks and never does anything else. 
and doesn't have anything else. And um, that's like, I wasn't going to allow that. Like I knew, but I knew that more success wouldn't fill the hole. You know, it wasn't just a matter of being more successful. Success is great. Don't get me wrong. But it was a matter of how I was dealing with the people in my life and my life in general um, and how I was seeing life. And uh, that had to change before I could get on to a better path. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, I never really looked into that until, until I saw that, that there's like this one page piece about how you got started getting into it. And I think that's really interesting and compelling. And we're going to drop that in the, in the notes too, but um, wrapping up here with a few more questions. Uh, what's one productivity hack you can share with the audience? Uh, I'm telling you meditation. Like uh, it's, I, I know I'm not the first to, to talk about this. If your audience like reads a lot of productivity stuff, I'm sure they've seen a lot of really smart people talk about meditation in the last five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a reason for that. Uh, it, I, I thought it was bullshit too. And first I've spent a lot of time reading the science and the, like the fMRIs and all the studies about it. Cause I thought this is total bullshit. It, it, scientifically it's not bullshit, but even once you know the science, it's just so easy to dismiss it as new age nonsense. Right. Uh, and it took me a long time before I actually sat down and tried it. And the first two to three weeks, uh, I, it was no, I, nothing happened because I was doing it wrong. And once I kind of made a few tweaks and did it right, it was shocking to me the differences. And what's crazy is I didn't notice them because they were kind of slow. It's sort of like, you know, when you start working out, no one time going to the gym does anything, but all of a sudden you look in the mirror three months later and you're like, you've lost 20 pounds and you can see your abs and you can see some definition in your arms. You're like, oh my God, you know, it was sort of one of those things where um, two things happened in a row. One uh, a person I've known for a long time, uh, we, whatever, it's a long story and the details don't matter, but basically she was, we dealt with, I, I was in a stressful situation. And I handled it really well. And she looked at me and she's like, what the hell is going on? Because you never would have handled this like this. Like, are you on like some sort of drugs? Did you take mushrooms or something? I was like, no. Like, uh, <laughs> and, and so she didn't know I was meditating. She's just like, what? what? You're not the Tucker I've known for 10 years. And then uh, another thing, uh, basically, um, my wife mentioned it. She's like, she's like, uh, you know, I don't know. Like, have you been meditating? I was like, yeah. She's like, I can tell. I'm like, how can you tell? And, you know, she knows me better than anyone on earth. And so it's like she kind of went through and I was like, oh, wow. It was other people that saw these changes in me more than me necessarily feeling them because it's like a small accumulation. All meditation really does is help you get emotionally centered. It doesn't calm you down. Like everyone thinks it's like, oh, you meditate and then you're fine. You're No, no, it's more that it helps you learn how to use your brain appropriately and how to interact with your emotions and your unconscious in a way that is productive instead of sort of reactive. It's active instead of reactive, I guess, is a good way to describe it. And um, yeah, dude, it, it really fundamentally like helped me in ways that, that even psychoanalysis didn't. Combining those two things was the big thing. Now, do you use any, like, to, to get the meditation started, I mean, are you using any like guided meditation apps, anything around that, or how are you going about it? Yeah, uh, so, Man, I read so much stuff. I'm I'm like a high information over learner type, right? So um, there is, um, uh, you know what actually might be the best thing? I read this. Uh, I could have just read this, even though I read this last. There's a million great books. Sam Harris has a ton of great stuff on meditation. Google Sam Harris meditation. He has like an uh, like a blog post. It's like a beginner's guide. That's a good place to start. There's also another book, it's on Amazon, and it costs like 99 cents. I think it's called like Buddha in Blue Jeans or something like that. And uh, those two, I think, are probably the best places to start. Um, if you're serious about meditation from there, uh, Sam Harris recommends a ton of stuff, which, which is all really good. And you can kind of dive into that rabbit hole, and there's a million places. The other thing I would actually read, too, if you're more intellectual and you want more of, a, of an intro, is... Um, it's a book called The Trauma of Everyday Life by Mark Epstein. Uh, uh, Mark Epstein's a, a psychiatrist. He is kind of the guy who's pioneered combining psychoanalysis with meditation. And The Trauma of Everyday Life is his best work. It's about um, how the Buddha uh, uh, actually, how meditation was the Buddhist version of psychoanalysis. It sounds really boring and dry. It's actually an incredible read. And it will teach you not just how to meditate and about meditation, but it also will teach you 
uh, how that interacts with yourself. Like, you don't have to know anything about psychoanalysis. It'll teach you all the lessons of psychoanalysis without you having to know psychoanalysis. It's really good. And then one more book that's really popular, quick read, which is also good, is called 10% Happier by Dan Harris. Um, he, he, it's this guy who's like totally analytical and, and rigorous and scientific and, and like that type of thinker and how he got into meditation. And uh, it's a really good intro for people who are very skeptical because he's like the biggest skeptic of this. And uh, he's like a news anchor on ABC and he had a breakdown on like the air. It was kind of famous. And then he realized he had to change something and he he chose meditation alone instead of like I was meditation and psychoanalysis um and and it's his story it's a really easy quick read those four and he's like friends with Epstein and Sam Harris too so those those four books I think are any of those four would work hmm. okay yeah it's it's interesting I mean every you know every entrepreneur talks about it and I think it's bullshit too but once you start doing it it's it's so not bullshit like you're saying so thanks for that I'm going to definitely check all these out um so Final question. What's next for Tucker Max? I mean, you got this startup coming. Are you going to do like a podcast like Tim Ferriss, anything like that? <laughs> well, I, no, uh, I, I actually have a podcast that's about sex and dating advice for young guys. It's called, <laughs> it's called The Mating Grounds. Uh, I do with, with Jeffrey Miller. Um, that's sort of like a side project, like a hobby. It's not really a business thing for me. Uh, what's next for me, man, is just more of what I'm doing. Like, I, you know, my son's six months months old and I'm excited to like raise him and, and kind of see him grow up. And then I'm really excited about Book in a Box. I think that we can do a lot of cool things, especially if we, if we can do this as software as a service. And that means that anyone anywhere in the world for almost any amount of money can be able to turn their ideas into books in a quick, easy way instead of the awful process that exists now. I think that would be really cool. I'm just excited about the things we're doing, and I want to just make them bigger and better and and more impactful. You know, awesome. And what's the best way for people to find you online? Uh, have you ever heard of the Google? <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, you know, that's a good question. Actually, I, I joke because I don't have a good answer because right uh, right now I have TuckerMax.com, which is sort of my old frat tire writing, and then I have TuckerMax.me, which is sort of like new stuff I've been writing. And then I have like the mating grounds and I have book in a box and I have like I, that you bring up a good point. Uh, I need to get my shit to, uh, together and have one sort of combined platform that's like the beginner's guide to me and points people in the direction that they want from the stuff I have. I, that's actually on my to-do list. It's just below some other things. Um, yeah, so I don't – it just depends what you want. If you want book in a box, go to bookinabox.com. If you want to read my old stuff, go to tuckermax.com. If you want to read my new stuff, go to tuckermax.me. Awesome. Everyone, this is Tucker Max, you know, the guy I used to idolize, still idolize. Um, you know, great, uh, great new product out, book in a box, or I should call it a service. Um, and Tucker, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, man. How many of you have experienced making a bad hire or had bad hires on your team? I personally lost over $840,000 on just one bad hire alone. So that's why I'm doing a free class called the five secrets to avoiding bad hires that can cost you $50,000 plus each. All you need to do is to text bad hire, spell it out, B-A-D-H-I-R-E to 33444. That's double three, triple four, and you'll be registered. I'll see you there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Everywhere. If you loved what you heard, be sure to head back to growtheverywhere.com for today's show notes and a ton of additional resources. But before you go, hit the subscribe button to avoid missing out on next week's value-packed interview. Enjoy the rest of your week and remember to take action and continue growing.